So one of the important things to remember about census data is they they collect an awful lot of data. We tend to think of census in terms of the decennial census every 10 years. And so that is kind of where people's brains go to when they think of the census. But there's tremendous amount of additional data, not just demographic data, but economic information. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today is the demographic side of the census house. And one of the most important things for you to remember is that the decennial census every 10 years is only this very short list of data characteristics. Previous to the 2010 census, all of the detailed socioeconomic information, income and education and employment and housing came from the census sample questionnaire that was eliminated prior to the 2010 census, eliminated as part of the census operation, but it's now gathered in the American Community Survey, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So the important thing to remember when you're dealing with 2010, 2020 census information, it's this very limited characteristics, only those characteristics that are required by the Constitution and legal requirements for the Voting Rights Act. Okay, Priya, next one. The successor to all of that socioeconomic data is something called the American Community Survey. Now, it was eliminated, for, these questions were eliminated from the 2010 census, but we already had the data uh, prior to that. The American Community Survey planning started in 1995, but in 2005, the Census Bureau actually did their first nationwide implementation. And so we've had this data since 19, since 2005. And you can see from this list that it's, it's very comprehensive. It gives us economic information and social characteristics and housing characteristics uh, that were again previously in that sample form of the decennial census. Census data, when this was gathered in the decennial census, we got these indicators refreshed once every 10 years. That was one of the big motivations for implementing the American Community Survey, because now we get this data refreshed every year. So it's much easier for us to monitor changes in demographic characteristics over time with the American Community Survey. Okay, next one. Now, geography in the census is one of the things that you really need to learn. And since we're dealing with GIS, geographic information systems, that's the heart of it. And the big question is, how do I relate data to the geography? So this, this schematic uh, gives you the basic hierarchy of some of the geographic areas that the census provides to you. Uh, the line right down the middle, I'll start at the bottom, it's census blocks. Census blocks are, pardon the phrase, the building block for all of the geography, summer, geographic summaries that the census provides. If you live in a city urban area, then you can think of a census block as uh, a city block bounded by four streets. I live out in rural Albany, New York, Albany County, New York, and my census block, I have to drive about three and a half miles to totally enclose my census block. So if you're in a rural area, geographically, they are very different. Conceptually, they're the same. They are bounded by features or recognizable um, landmarks. Census blocks are aggregated into block groups. There's Basically, uh, eight, 10 blocks make up a block group. Block groups are aggregated into census tracts where there's, oh, maybe five or eight block groups to a census tract. Census tracts are hugely important. So that's a term for you to remember. Census tracts average about 4,000 in population, but they are small enough that we can use them to identify uh, neighborhood areas within uh, more densely settled areas and large enough that there aren't so many of them that it's a manageable uh, entity and also from a survey standpoint, um, much 
better or usable margins of error and more accurate. Census tracts are unique within counties. So every one of the 3,000 uh, plus counties in the United States has census tracts and they are unique. Numbering may be repeated, but you'll find a census tract one in lots of counties, but census tract one in Albany County is unique. Counties make up our states. For most of our states, Louisiana has parishes but they're analogous to counties. The Census Bureau aggregates states into divisions and regions, and all of this adds up to the nation. So all of the 11 million blocks in the country will add up to the national total. Now along both sides here, you see a sampling of some of the other geographic areas that the census can be aggregated into. And I'm gonna talk about two categories of those, political and statistical areas. So if we can go to the next slide, Bruno. So political areas, I distinguish political areas because they have three things that statistical areas do not have. Number one, they have legal boundaries. So our states, all of our states have detailed legal boundaries. Our counties have legal boundaries. So that is one of the primary characteristics of a political area. A second one is that they have elected officials. States have governors. Counties, uh, the title may vary. In New York, we call them county managers or county executives, but in different states, they may call them something else, but they have an elected official at the county level. And the third thing that they all have are governmental powers. They can pass laws, they can uh, pass taxes that uh, apply to their political area, to their state, to their county, to their city, town, or village. So all of these, and forgive me, I tend to revert back to New York's terminology. Uh, we call our minor civil divisions cities and towns. Other states call them townships. Uh, Native American reservations are independent sovereign lands, but we treat them in the census hierarchy and for tabulations of data as if they were a minor civil division. Minor civil division might also be termed, or you might also hear as a different term, county subdivision. All that means is both definitions are entities, political entities that make up 100% of the land area of counties. And another one, incorporated places. Places in census uh, jargon are concentrations of population. And in New York, they are incorporated as cities and villages. Towns are incorporated, but they are not places in New York. Uh, if you're familiar with New York City, oftentimes folks in New York City refer to the boroughs, the five boroughs of New York City. They are also counties, it can get confusing. I'm from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's boroughs are analogous to our villages. So terminology may differ, but recognize that Census Bureau is required to provide data for all of these political governmental units. Next one, Priya. So the other category that I like to recognize or distinguish are statistical areas. These are areas, uh, many when the Census Bureau defines them are defined for the collection and reporting of data. They differ from political areas because their boundaries may change without any legal authority. They have no elected officials. They have no governmental powers. The names may vary from uh, state to state, but the census has particular definitions. A couple of these to point out. Uh, the second one here, census designated places. In New York, we call these hamlets. They are concentrations of population, but they are not legally incorporated governmental units. Again, we call them hamlets. People recognize where they are by their name, but they have no legal boundaries. The Census Bureau, if in working with local officials, will define a statistical boundary for them so that they can tabulate data, makes it more useful. 
Uh, the last two on the bottom are also, uh, these are federal definitions, micro, metropolitan and micropolitan statistical areas. Uh, these are county-based units. Metropolitan areas can make, are made up of, uh, in, in many cases, a number of counties. Uh, in the Albany area, there are five counties that make up the Albany, Schenectady, Detroit metropolitan area. In Boston, um, there are going to be a number of the surrounding suburban counties that are part of of the metropolitan area. And in fact, in the New England states, towns become important in this definition. Urban and rural areas. These, these terms and metropolitan, micropolitan often get confused, but they are very different. I'm in a metropolitan Albany County, but most of Albany County's land area is rural, has different definitions. So all you need to remember is that when you see these terms, they have very specific operational definitions within the federal statistical establishment. Now, Bob, the, uh, how do the statistical boundaries match the political boundaries? So, I mean, you know, looking at these versus the ones that we saw in the political ones. Or in the case not? of metropolitan and micropolitan areas, those are always made up of counties. So the answer would be yes. Urban and rural areas can be very different. So you can imagine a, a city center. Imagine, um, since you guys are located in Massachusetts and Boston, and imagine Boston. You have Boston City, which becomes the core. And then you build out through the suburban areas um, based on a population density at the block level. At some point, you reach more rural areas, mm -hmm. and that point where you have a shift between uh, a densely settled block and a uh, sparsely settled block becomes a boundary for the urban area. So mm -hmm. urban and rural areas are very different definitions than metropolitan, and they do not follow the political boundaries. But the census of blocks, groups, and tracts, do they follow? Um, no. no. Well, no. yes and no. Census tracts are unique within counties, but the census tracts can cover multiple towns, townships. Uh, census tracts can be um, split within a governmental unit, but they, they will not be split by county boundaries, only uh, minor civil division or sub-county areas within the county. Great. So I think you're going to talk about the data now, which is what I've seen everybody is excited about at this point and how to get at it. Yes. What data is available? Well, um, the, the next slide gives you kind of an overview to at this point, we've broken, broken out the products overview in these four categories. So the first one, the redistricting file, and I'll talk each about these in a little more detail, is currently available. Uh, this is one of the legal requirements the Census Bureau has to uh, abide by, and it was made available uh, back in September. Most states were available in September of last year. Number two, the demographic profile, we're anxiously, anxiously awaiting this. Um, and its tentative date is sometime in 2022. Well, we're in that year. Hopefully, we're going to be looking at this in the early part of the year, um, but we don't really know. Census hasn't been more specific. Number three, demographic and housing characteristics file. Now, this is, uh, and again, I'll talk about this more uh, in a minute, is uh, reflective of the demographic profile, but much more detailed. And it's, again, tentatively 2022. Um, what, unfortunately, I've learned in, in all my years of working with the census is um, don't ever pin them down to a reference date or a release date uh, because they are they are under a lot of pressure and statistical um, operations processing to make this data available. So again, we'll hope that it's a little later in the year, but we hope that we get this detail um, certainly in this this coming year. But this and is finally unusual, the, unusual Bob, right? Because of the pandemic, everything has got delayed further. So that's another point that is that's important. Uh, yeah, without we could we could have a whole lesson on that, but uh, the Census Bureau timing was totally thrown off by the pandemic. Their operations um, were put on hold back in March 
of 2020. And it was three months before most of the op those operations uh, got back in swing. So that's, uh, we would have had a lot of this data by now in a normal census year. But the American Community Survey will be coming up soon, and I will get into some detail about that. So this redistricting file, as I mentioned, it's available. Uh, it meets the requirements of Public Law 94171, which was the congressional authorization to that required certain characteristics be delivered to states that met the Voting Rights Act requirements and was the basis for state redistricting. So all of the states have these files and they many of them are completed in their congressional reapportionment, um, but many of them are still working on it. This is just very basic data. Voting age population is 18 and over. The race and Hispanic Latino origin data provides uh, very detailed information on racial categories and Hispanic Latino categories separately, but also in combination. Housing occupancy gives us just the total number of housing units by whether they are occupied or vacant. Group quarters are uh, special group living situations. Uh, the most notable are colleges, uh, nursing homes, military barracks, prisons, group living situations um, where uh, the Census Bureau counts the facility and the persons that are residing in that facility. All of this data is available at the census block level. So for all 11 million blocks in the country, you get this detailed data. And that's what state legislative uh, commissions are working with. Uh, how, do you, how do you put together the jigsaw puzzle of blocks to create their new congressional district boundaries and state and county local legislative boundaries. That data is already available and we already use it for a lot of purposes. And again, a little clear uh, reference here. The one thing I want to point out is to make sure that you understand there's a difference between race definition and Hispanic or Latino origin. This data is captured in two separate questions. Individuals are first asked whether they are of Hispanic or Latino origin and what type, Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, et cetera. And then they are asked the second question on what their race is, white, black, or African-American, American, African-American, um, American, American, Indian, Alaskan Native, Asian population, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, limited number of racial categories, and those two things can be viewed separately, but also in combination. And that's often necessary and important to remember. And then those tabulations are uh, um, repeated only for the voting age population, 18 and over. And then group quarters data is by type. Okay, so the next one. This demographic profile will be based on the basic characteristics that are gathered in the decennial census, but it gives us more detail than what that redistricting file gives us. So, you know, the, one of the most important things as a demographer, we're anxiously waiting for the five-year age group data. Uh, the redistricting file only gives us the 18 and over population. So demographically, that's a hugely important uh, advancement. But it also gives us by, data by sex, cross-tabulated by race and Hispanic uh, Latino origin. So that's the important thing to remember. The basic profile uh, um, redistricting data is now cross-classified by a number of these dimensions to give us more detail. Household relationship, how are you related to the household? Um, a spouse, son or daughter, um, adopted child, aunt, uncle, siblings, whatever that related uh, characteristic is, as well as people who are not related to the householder. If uh, domestic help or um, uh, foster children are in the house or uh, a rumor or border, that becomes an unrelated person in the household. Census uh, expects the lowest level of geography to be places, villages, cities, and minor civil divisions, towns, townships, and again, tentatively scheduled for this year, hopefully the early part rather than later part. And the next 
file that comes out of the 2020 census is called the demographic housing characteristics file similar to the old 2010 census summary file uh, summary file was the terminology used for a number of decades very similar but not quite as detailed this is where some of the Census Bureau's privacy concerns have come into play and have limited some of the detailed uh, data. So age, for example, and I'll use this as an example. We haven't seen the, the final specifications, but uh, historically we would get age in single year up to uh, 100 or more which from a demographer's standpoint was usually important, that age detail may be restricted, uh, still more so than the five-year data, uh, five-year age groups, but it may still be restricted in some manner. So this will give us a lot more data than a profile gives us, similar to the old 2010 data, but not quite as detailed as some of us uh, census data geeks would really like to see. The Census Bureau hasn't told us the level of geography yet uh, or specified a date. And the last data source that I want to mention is the detail of the American Community Survey. Now, I showed you some of the basic categories, but this gets a little bit more detailed and serves two purposes for us. So the Census Bureau provides these three basic profiles beyond the demographic data. So the DP02 social characteristics profile, more detail on households by type and relationship and fertility and marital status and education, grandparents, disability, you can read the list. This becomes very detailed information um, about our social characteristics. The DP3 economic characteristics, similarly, uh, a subset of data, but much more detailed. Employment status gives us um, armed forces and civilian employment by gender, um, whether people are employed or unemployed. What occupation do you hold? What industry do you work in? Class of worker is whether you're a private sector, public sector. Income characteristics, household and family, income distributions and benefits received. Whether you have health insurance coverage, the type of coverage and age uh, breakdowns and poverty status of families and individuals, uh, families by type, um, married couple families versus single male, single female families, individuals, children versus seniors, much more detail. And you can see a long list for housing also. Uh, housing is generally in three categories, occupancy characteristics, uh, characteristics of occupied versus vacant uh, units, structural characteristics about the building you live in, uh, the year it was built and numbers of rooms, whether you own or rent the unit, um, how many vehicles do you have uh, available? Um, how do you heat it? Do you have plumbing, kitchen and telephone available? What are the financial characteristics? The last point I want to make about this is these titles. Notice I've identified them as DP02, 03, 04. As you get into the Census Bureau's dissemination system, it's important to start learning these table identifiers because they will rapidly get you to the data that you want once you learn what they are and what data content is in them. And the URL at the bottom, if you really turn into a census data geek, you can download this table shell file, which gives you down to the individual variable and characteristic, the entire file layout of data that's available for each one of the detailed tables. Okay. So, now the data. <laughs> yeah, now how do we get to this data? Um, the data access system is data.census.gov. That's the URL. So if you Google that or just type it into your browser, you're going to come to this page. I'll be frank with you, I really don't like it. The system itself is very powerful. Once you get used to it, uh, you can get an awful lot out of it, no question. What I don't like is this interface because for the person who doesn't really know what it is they're looking for, kind of leaves me hanging as to what I do next. Uh, if I hit the, we're not doing a live demo, but if I hit that view tables button, it's gonna give me 
three or four or five basic tables. And then it's also going to tell me that there are 3,901 other tables. How am I going to weed through those? The data profiles give me three areas here. How do I get to my geographic area, my town, my city? Uh, map visualizations. Yes, you can do an awful lot. This gives me some examples, but how do I really get to that? So it, it's my introduction, but it doesn't really get me where I want to go. And so the more you learn about the geography and the table IDs, the better off you'll be. So I've gotten used to just putting a table ID into that search box at the top. And the next slide will show you something that I might get. So out of the 2020 census data, you can see at the top under P1 race, it tells me the source of the data that I'm looking at. Uh, I just entered P1 in that search box because I know what P1 will get me. And this is the type of uh, result table you get. Um, and you can see some other tables that it lists, which may or may not be relevant to what I want to do. And that's kind of what I object to in the way the census has things set up, but my data is here. And it usually always defaults to the United States. And so you can get a first look at what that 2020 data is for the United States, total population, population. If I identify only one race and then two or more races and, and the multiple categories. But this page also gives you a look at two other things. On the left-hand side, uh, the sidebar gives you different filters that you can use. And data.census.gov is sort of like Amazon in that you're all constantly filtering. If you search for sneakers in Amazon, you're going to get 3 billion hits. But it'll allow you to search by brand and color and size and a number of other things. That's what they're doing here. You can search by codes unless you really know what codes mean mm -hmm. in census jargon, that doesn't get you very far. But geography, primary thing for you to learn about how the Census Bureau references geography. The same with the surveys and topics. They're introductory filters, but you need to go to a higher level of um, detail. And the next slide, Priya, will we'll get you to a little bit more detail and uh, a better look at one of these profiles. So what I've uh, got a screenshot here of is the economic characteristics profile. So you can see there's more detailed uh, employment status here than what I referenced earlier. But also I've set up the geography to give me all of the census tracts within the town of Plymouth in Massachusetts. And what you're seeing on the screen is just a handful of them. Um, you can scroll to the right and get all of the other uh, census tracts. You can scroll down and get all of the other detailed uh, profile information in the selected economic characteristics. And now along the top bar, you can see some of the filters again, that one geo, that's where I specified that I wanted census tracts for Plymouth. And so you can go in there and you can get um, hundreds of different uh, levels of geography. Years, in this case, um, you know, I'm looking at the ACS data for 2019. If I typed in years, I would get a list of other years of ACS data for which census tracts would apply. So you really just need to do some exploring of all of these links. The, the last one that I'll mention here, well, I'll mention two. Um, the first one, I'm, I'm going to jump around a little bit, though, and go to the end of the uh, task bar here and the download bar. Um, download allows you to grab this data as a file uh, in a couple of different formats. The large files are zipped and you have to be able to uh, work with zipped files. Okay, So it gives you a lot of different ways to extract this data. The one I want to end with is this transpose icon um, because census always gives you the geographic areas as columns, the data content as 
um, rows. That doesn't always work. Uh, I do what GIS work I do personally. I'm generally creating an Excel file that requires my geography to be rows and my variables to be columns. So this transpose button does exactly this. You could go back and forth between these two screens and you see that one is content uh, variables as uh, rows, geography is columns, and you can go back and forth. Sometimes that's a convenient thing to be able to do. And, and your, your task is really to become familiar with three things. Geographies, how the Census Bureau looks at geography, table IDs and the content of those tables or profiles, and finally, tools like transpose and download that make it easier for you to access the data. And I think wow. I better stop there. <laughs> wow, Bob, that was a lot of information. Thank you so much. Um, I think it, it is a lot. It's dense. You've helped us distill it a little bit. And um, I mean, that's the key thing here that we're you know, trying to communicate to uh, our listeners is that um, it's a lot. It's overwhelming. And you know, we're here to help you um, work with it, uh, brainstorm on what are the problems that you're trying to solve and how the census data and the geographies can help you, um, uh, you know, come to a solution or at least give you some direction in which you can use for your planning, um, you know, um, uh, questions or uh, problems that you might have or, um, you know, coming up with ideas as well is something that, that we do. Um, and to that end, um, I'm going to have uh, Brianna come on and uh, she's going to talk to us about um, how you know we've used some of this ACS data and she'll explain what she's done, but uh, we've used it in the context of one of our clients and just to sort of you know highlight to you how it can be used and how um, this data can be then joined to the uh, to the geographies and then visualized. And so Brianna, I'll let you take over and explain uh, what you've done. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so if you just go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, this first example map was created using the 2020 census release. On the smallest level of geography that we could get the results from was block group data. So that's what we used for this, as well as the following examples. Um, for all of these maps, we focused on the town of Milford, Massachusetts, to show the different maps that be, can be created within one community. But please note that there are a plethora of different maps and examples beyond the ones that we'll demonstrate that you can use and can be applicable for your city or town. Uh, the data table that we chose for 2020 was occupancy status, which looks at how much space in a given area is occupied or vacant. This can be important for understanding how much space in a given area is occupied or vacant and for the majority of residents that live and work within your city or town, as well as pinpointing the areas that you could advertise to businesses to occupy the space. One of the great things about the census is that you can compare the distribution of space and how that has changed over time. Just go to the next slide. So yeah, just to um, again sort of reiterate, this is the connection between what Bob was showing us as far as all the tabular data is concerned and then the geography. So Brianna has just joined the two using that, you know, you have to do the, the step of transpose and she'll get into that detail a little bit more, right? Brianna, your, your process will explain how this is done. Yes, I'll go through some examples and then I'll show a little bit about the process. So these two maps here are comparing the occupancy status of Milford from 2010 to 2020. Um, being able to see the changes visually helps to quickly determine which block groups have become more or less occupied. You can see there, if we take a look at those highlighted areas, um, specifically looking at the top one, you can see that it has been become more heavily occupied. And then specifically the most drastic change that you can see in the area where it was moderately occupied in 2010 is now more heavily occupied. And it's important to note that the blocks can change over time. So you can use this as a generalized picture of the changes and then perform a more in-depth look at the differences to determine if things have been altered. But overall, being able to view these changes can help to see how your town has grown or shifted throughout the years. That's great. Yeah, for this next example, we wanted to look at what areas of town may experience greater levels of food insecurity. To do this, we use data from the 2019 ACS five-year estimates. This survey and the time length provides most accurate and in-depth data that's applicable to the local or municipal level. 
from this, we found a table that can help to operationalize who may experience food insecurity by determining which households have received food stamps within the past year. From here, we define our research question, what percentage of households are on food stamps in Milford, Mass? This type of question can be important to visualize because it helps to determine which parts of your town may, you may want to target resources to by creating programs or services as aid in those areas. It could also be useful to look at where there are current resources, such as food pantries, to determine if they're located in the areas of the greatest need, but also to see where you could place more. Looking at the receipt of food stamps by disability status could be a good way to see if food insecurity further impacts those with disabilities and to see if the services provided need to be better accessible to that population. It could also be helpful to layer different variables like race or income to further examine the intersections of the population that experience food insecurity the most. Yeah, and this is really helpful in the current context. So, you know, Brianna, this is great, great work. Thank you. Yeah, so those first two examples um, are themes that are currently live on Milford's Map Geo site, while this last theme is newly created to show that you can come up with new ideas and how we offer them to clients. This map is looking at the elderly presence in households to see the spatial distribution of the elderly population in your city or town. Again, we use the 2019 ACS five-year estimates as our data source and specifically looked at the table with households by presence of people over 65 over 65, excuse me. The map rendering does have a different look um, from the previous examples because we created this in ArcGIS Pro instead of through our MapGeo platform as it's a new potential theme offering. Understanding where the elderly population is in your town can be important, again, for targeting resources, specifically for the seniors. Often, the elderly need healthcare services, and some may be homebound and would benefit from telehealth services. So something that you can compare this map with is a map displaying broadband availability. Comparing elderly presence with different modes of transportation can help to determine if there is proper accessibility for seniors to travel around town. In some spaces, you may want to also map our libraries, healthcare facilities, grocery stores, etc., to see if the current transportation services stop at those places that the seniors may tend to go to more. You could also compare this with another theme, such as accessibility, to see if these areas that are already there are suitable and safe for the seniors who are disabled. And the best part about being able to visualize the data using JS software like this um, is the ability to layer the different maps and see overlapping areas of interest where instead of running analyses and comprehending the questions only in the form of tables and statistics. Absolutely. Okay, so you're gonna describe how you would put this together. Yeah. So um, there are different data processing softwares that you can utilize to be able to import census data files, which can be downloaded from the census website as Bob showed us. Um, there are two really great data integration programs that we use that allow you to manipulate and merge data sets together with their spatial components. And those are Alteryx and FME. As you can see in the screenshots, they have different functionings that you can be able to import, export, select specific data and attach spatial data. Um, and while these are the ones that we like to use, you can achieve this with other GIS software such as ArcGIS Pro. So don't think that these integration softwares are the only ways that you can process your data. Um, we specifically used Alteryx to set up the processes and make the data set for all Massachusetts cities and towns to be able to visualize the maps I showed today. And I'll briefly walk you through the process to have a more high level understanding. So we first narrowed down the data sets that we wanted to use and we downloaded them as CSV files from the census website. We transposed them as Bob showed earlier. So all of the demographic information were in columns. Um, we then went into Alteryx and input every data file that we wanted to combine into this one large data set. Each table has many different columns with subjects that you may not need. So we used a select tool to pick out the different columns that have the subjects that we would want to focus on. And now that we have all the data that we want selected, we wanna make sure that all of the data aligns with the corresponding city or town. So all of census data is attached to something called a geo ID, which is a unique identifying number that is given to all administrative, legal and statistical geographic areas. So this ID is what you can use to group all of the different data sets together according to their correct city and town. And I achieved this by doing a multiple join. 
Um, next, we want to make sure that the spatial data matches with the correct geo ID. So the proper geometry is being represented. So we used one of the spatial features to attach a shape file to the correct city or town block groups. And the shape files can be downloaded from the census website as well. This will allow us to actually see the different level of geography that we want when we're visualizing the data later on in a GIS mapping software. And lastly, if things aren't quite lining up spatially, such as gaps within the geometry, you can use certain tools to correct that if necessary within this program. And lastly, we output the data to our files as a geo database file so that it can be opened into a different GIS software for map creation. And while this is a more high level process, it is something that we do for our map geo clients. Um, if they have specific data that they want represented on their site and they want it all in one file for easy access. And we also create some of our own theme packages as well. And we offer them to clients and I'll share some ideas. So here are some examples of ideas that we have come up with that could be useful to look into depending on what the needs of your local government are. We specifically tried to come up with ways that you could compare different levels and different variables to see how they may impact one another. So this is why we call them multivariate themes. All of these variable names and the tables that we found were when we were looking at the 2019 ACS data. So the first example, housing value and rent pricing, something that you could see is if the high rent areas also have high home values and vice versa, it could be something that you could look into for household language and educational attainment. You could see a question that you could ask is, does language barrier correlate with the level of education achieved within your town? And you could see if you potentially need to offer different language aid to help those. Um, for food insecurity and employment status, a question that you could ask is, does employment status impact their level of food insecurity to try and see if there are better ways to aid those individuals? And lastly, with employment type and income, you can ask questions such as, do certain types of employment yield similar income in your town? Um, what kinds of jobs do people have? And overall, what are they making? And could this, this could be useful if you're trying to find what your target work demographic is within your city or town. So yeah, hopefully these examples have given you all some valuable information on how you can take your questions, find the data, and then do the work to visualize it so it can be useful for the decision making within your community. Well, that's great, Brianna. Thank you so much. Um, you know, as as you can see, uh, there's really, and, and I think if you remember back at Bob's list of the ACS fields, um, you know, Brianna, I assume you looked at that list and then you saw what could be matched with what, and you know, you can really uh, come up with your own custom question, and then that can be visualized on a map. And um, also, you know, output as as a, um, a you know, if there's certain blocks that need attention, you would actually get that information and see what's in that in that particular um, you know statistical area or political area. So. So uh, this is just giving you a really, uh, you know, high level view of, of what can be done with the census data, what, you know, Bob's explanation of um, what um, products are available out there, and then how you can spatially visualize them. So uh, thank you so much, Priyana. Thank you, Bob.